Folks, today we're going to be looking at some stuff that um, I think is going to really bless you. And I've, it's kind of a long title that I've got. I was looking at it and thought, well, Lord, I want to share these things. God was giving me these these things from the scriptures. But, uh, but I want it to be... I want it to be real to us. And, and the title is Hearing God in You and Living Out of Who He Says You Are. Hearing God in You and Living Out of Who He Says You Are. I'm going to read, let me go ahead and read it now. I'm going to read a quote and from uh, Ron Block's great book. And if you think I'm quoting it a lot lately, well, I am because it's really good. And I was reading and, and, uh, and this, this was the last thing in a in particular chapter. And I want to read it to you and listen to this. Then we're going to talk about it. Then I'm going to share some scripture verses with you. According to Jesus, there's only one source of life, and it's not come to the Bible. Or come to sermons, or come to more giving, more praying, more doing for Jesus. It's not even come to your devotional. Jesus says, come to me. And that's from Abiding Dependence by Ron Block. I encourage you to get that book, Abiding Dependence by Ron Block. So many people read the Bible as an instruction booklet. I did, and I bet you have too. And if you come to the Bible trying to understand God, you'll never understand the Bible and you'll never understand God. But as the Spirit reveals truth to you inside of you, where He abides, and as He becomes your life-giving source, which He always has been, then not only will you understand God, but you will understand the Bible. Let me say again what I just said. If you go to the Bible so that you can understand God, you're not going to understand God or the Bible. Now, I'm not saying people even have to know what they're doing. You see, the Spirit reveals Himself in truth as we're reading the Bible, but He reveals things to us even before we go to the Bible. Some people think, and this is a mistake, that God only speaks through the Scriptures today. And that is not the case. God speaks to us in any number of ways. Sometimes we can hear the wisdom of a child. A child will say something that'll just pierce our hearts. Sometimes it's a simple thing like, I love you. It could be anything. God speaks to us, and the Bible says, in a still, small voice. He speaks to us in the wind. He speaks to us in nature. Now, Nature is not God. Understand that. But God is in nature. All things are in Christ. All people are too, but all things are in Christ. So I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit speaks to us any way He chooses. The problem is we don't hear. We don't hear. He'll speak to you in hard things, and He'll speak to you in joyous things. Okay, you can't understand the Bible or what you think it is saying without first understanding God the Father, Christ the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and what they have done and given to you and to all. If you don't understand the nature of God, the Bible's real plain on this. It says one, one nature. He has one nature. The Bible says God is love. We sing about it almost every week. God is love. That is his nature. If you read the Bible and you're not seeing God the Father as a loving God toward all men, then you don't understand the nature of God the Father and you'll never be able to understand the Bible. If you read it with any other idea, any other lens than that, to try and read the Bible as a manual for living and then go and do it, and I wrote this. I want to read it, whatever. And then go and do it. It leads to disappointment and defeat because trying to flesh living out is a recipe for disaster. I'm an expert. I'm an expert on that. 
If you're trying to read the Bible to get the ideas what you're supposed to do and then go and do it, you're going to be disappointed, you're going to be defeated, and if you're trying to flesh out this thing of living in the Spirit, then that's a recipe for disaster. God never intended us to flesh out anything at all. Well, he has not only given himself and his life for us, but he has given his life to us and reveals himself in us. Let me read that again. He has not only given his, himself and his life for us, but he has given his life to us and reveals himself to us. He reveals himself. Now, this is where it gets really strange. He reveals himself. Where does he reveal himself to you? Let me ask you a question. I, hmm. Yes, all of those things are right. But one specific place where he reveals himself. You're getting there. He reveals himself in you. In fact, he said that in Galatians uh, chapter 1, verse 16. Paul wrote this. He said, when it pleased him to reveal himself in me. Now, we would say to me. Yes, he does reveal himself to you. He reveals himself to you in you. You say, I don't believe that. Well, that's what I was talking about before. And we're going to see this in other places. But all throughout Scripture, this is what it tells us. Paul said that he was set apart from his mother's womb. In other words, from before he was born, he was already set apart. What does set apart mean? Holy. Holy. He was set apart from before the time that he was born. And he had Christ himself revealed in him so that he might preach him, and it says in the Greek, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 16, so that he might preach him in, and the English word is there is Gentiles. It could mean nations, but it could also, the primary translation for that is the family of man, so that he might preach him in the family of man. Now, some people, when they say this, the first thing they'll say, so you're saying everybody's going to heaven? Folks, that's not what I'm saying. But you know, the Bible says in, in uh, Romans chapter 10 that it says faith does not talk about who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. If that's all we think it is, then we've missed it. You know, if there was no heaven, if there was no hell, I would still want to know Christ because he is my life. He is our life-giving source. I would still want to know him. People need to know and they need to believe. They've not been told who Christ is and the fact that he has given himself to you. And this is from before the foundation of the universe, before the foundation of the cosmos. We translate it in the English, before the foundation of the world. He chose you in himself. And then it says, in love, he predestined you to adoption as sons. Now, those are facts. Those are in the scripture. I want to read to you John chapter 8, verse 7. I was in, you were with me, David. We were in Romania, and we were in a town called Brashov, and, uh, and I shared these verses one night, and they really came unglued. I mean, and it's great. And some of you have misinterpreted and misunderstood this too. We talk about the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Don't. Do we talk about that sometimes? And we talk about the Holy Spirit convicting me of what? What do most people talk about when they say, I was convicted by the Holy Spirit? That's exactly right. Most people say, he's convicting me of my sin. Would you agree with that? Would you not say that's what most people think? Would you say that's very scriptural? Most people would say, well, of course it is. Well, let me just say this. That's not what the scripture says. Do you know that sin sticks out to you and you hate it? You become aware of it. Does the Holy Spirit reveal your sin to you? Yes, but in a roundabout way. Let's look at what the scripture says about that. 
Now, again, if you don't understand the nature of God and where he is in relation to you and to all men, now they've not believed, they must believe, but they're believing what he has already done and they're believing who he has already given himself and they're believing that he's already forgiven them. He did it from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's aorist imperative. That's completed action. It's punctilier. It can't be done again. You've been forgiven. The cross is eternal. It applies to everyone. Forgiveness was given. Now, do we need to receive it? Yes, we do. Do we need to believe it? You know, tragically. Now, listen. Most people do not believe that they've been forgiven. Most people don't believe that. How do I know? Listen to how people pray. Father, please forgive us of all our sins. And I can just see the Spirit inside saying, He did. And then they'll go on to say, And Father, forgive us of the sins we don't even know we did. We're just covering all the bases. Forgive us of those two. You know, if I was God, and be glad I'm not, but if I was God, I'd say, hey, you don't believe me? You want to make me mad? I told you I forgave you. You better believe it. That's what I'd say. Do you realize when we pray that way, we're praying with unbelief? One of two problems. We don't know what he said or we don't believe it. One of two problems. Forgiveness. You've been forgiven. Well, in John chapter 18, I'm going to read verse 7 through 11. Then we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about four different scripture passages today. He says, but I tell you the truth. John 18, verse 7, down to 11. But I tell you the truth. Jesus is the one talking here. He said, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I'm going to send you the helper. What's another word for the helper? The Spirit. Holy Spirit. That's right. And he, talking about the Spirit, when he comes, now listen to this, will convict the world. Now, when we talk about the world, we're not talking about the bad stuff. We're talking about the cosmos, but we're talking about all the people and all that's going on, all that is made up of the world. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he's going to talk about what these are. Sin, first of all, because they do not believe in me. So what is the sin that he's going to convict them of? That's right. Two people said it. After everybody could have. He's going to convict them of their unbelief. Those that have not believed, sin, unbelief. We call it lying, cheating, stealing, fooling around, drinking, you know. Those are flesh. But the sin we're talking about is the sin of unbelief and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. Now let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Are you an unbeliever? The answer is no, you're not. Now, do you not believe sometimes? Of course, that's called flesh. But are you an unbeliever? No, you're not. So if he's not, if that's not talking about you, so then we're not talking about sin that he's going to convict you of. Are we talking about sin? No, you're a believer. So that's not you, okay? And I'm going to read verse 11, and then we're going to come back to verse 10. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Who are we talking about, the ruler of this world? Satan. We're talking about Satan. Is that you? No, it's not. So you're not the unbeliever, so he's not going to convict you of that. And he convicts people of unbelief because he loves them, by the way, because he wants them to know him. He wants them to know what he's done. So that's not you. Sin, that's not you. Judgment, that's not you. So let's come back to verse 10. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. So the Spirit of God, do you know what he wants to convict you of? What he does convict you of? Your righteousness. It's easier to make somebody believe that they're a sinner 
than that they're righteous. Much easier, especially religious folks. Religious folks struggle with this big. But the Word of God, or the Bible, the Scripture, Jesus is the Word of God. The Scriptures say, He who knew no sin became sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Let me ask you a question. Are you righteousness? I want everybody to answer. If you're watching from home, wherever you are, and you'll be on here around the world where there's, there's Brimer and over in Missouri and Arkansas won yesterday, way to go Brimer, and, uh, and Dossie up in Wisconsin, and, and there'll be other, other people on here at the same time. And Linda, she's from good old Fitzgerald, USA. And, uh, but you're righteous. The Holy Spirit is telling you that you're righteous. That word righteous means straight, without bend. You know, it's amazing. When Paul was knocked off his high horse, I got a sermon on that. One day I'll share it with you. It's, I think it's kind of cool. Paul, you know, God knocked Paul off his high horse. You know, he was going to kill some more Christians. He was involved in the killing of Stephen. He was there. And there was this appearance of the Lord knocked Paul off his horse. And the people that were with him, they didn't, they didn't hear to see it. They didn't know what was going on. And Paul said, who art thou, Lord? He answered his own question. And he was blinded. And he was scared and didn't know what to do. And you know what he told him? He said, I want you to go to, he gives us the name of the road. In the Bible, there's the name of the road. He says, I want you to go to Straight Street. Now, I think that's pretty cool. He said, what's the point? He said, there's going to be somebody there that's going to tell you. And when he got there, the scales were removed from his eyes, and he saw. Straight street, I like to call it. I want you to go to Righteous Avenue. I want you to see the source of your righteousness. The source of your righteousness is not in what you do or don't do. Folks, that's been the whole problem. This goes back to reading the Bible like a manual, like a... a con like a construction manual or an instruction manual or a manual of how to live. That is not what the Bible is. Do we learn things reading the Bible? Of course we do. The Spirit gives us His mind, and we read and we say, oh, yeah. But you see, Jesus is revealed in us. Now, does he explain things in the Bible? Of course he does. But his spirit explains things that are beyond anything we could see with our eyes on the inside. So notice this. The Spirit of God convicts you of your righteousness. You say you're spending a lot of time on that. Well, I am. You're right. You know why? Because you don't know it. So I want you to begin to believe it. For you not to believe this goes back to that first one, to the people that have never believed it. You're not, that's not you. You have believed Christ. Now, if you've not believed Christ, then he's going to convict you of not believing Christ. Then he's going to convict you of your righteousness. And he's going to convict the enemy, the, the devil. He's going to judge him. Now, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 through 29, I've put all these verses together today because they all apply. I'm going to show you a progression here. He convicts you of your righteousness. That's who you are. Okay. In Colossians 1 27, it says to whom God willed. Okay. God willed. Now, you know, wish and willed in the Bible are very, very similar words. In fact, sometimes they would use wish or will interchangeably. But let me tell you the difference. A wish, if I say, boy, I wish I had I wish I had $100. You know, you wish in one hand. I used to be an old saying, I won't say the way it was said in the Army, but, you know, you might spit in the other hand, wish and spit and see which one fills up the fastest. That's not the word they used in the Army. I won't tell you that word. Scubula. Okay, I won't give you the English for it. But a wish is, I just wish I had that. But then if I wish, and a, but the will is... I wish I had $100. Let me see. I could sell something or I could go work however many hours. You know, I could do something to cause it to be. 
in Second Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is faithful towards you, not wishing for any to perish, any, but for all to come to repentance. That word wish right there is not like I wish I had a million dollars or I wish I, you know, I wish I was seven feet tall so I could dunk a basketball or I wish I could jump. That would help too. That's a wish. But this word is not, you could put in not willing for any to perish. Willing. You see, he was not only not wanting anybody to perish, but he did something about it. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God the Father sent God the Son. They were in this together. God the Son became sin and died. Sin died on the cross in Jesus. God the Holy Spirit drew us to the cross from where our redemption comes, from the shed blood of Jesus, from the life of Christ. They were in it together. So it says... To whom God willed to make known. He has not only wished that you knew, but he's doing everything so that you do know. To make known what is the riches, are we going to see this? What is the riches of the glory of the mystery? And in the, it says in the English, now this is, it just, just really bothers me because the Greek scholars, I guarantee you they know what this word is. They know what it is. But this goes against, I'm talking about the translator. Some people translate it correctly. But in the New American Standard, I'm going to read something to you. To whom God willed his desire and he's going to cause it to be. That's what that means. To make known once and for all completed action. What is the riches of the glory of this mystery? And then in the English it says among the Gentiles. Among, you know, he's going to reveal it. Among, some going to know, some aren't. Among. That's like throwing a bucket of paint up in the sky and it lands on some of them, you know. But that's not what this word is. This word in the Greek is the same word in the Spanish, exactly the same word. The Spanish word is ain, E N. It's pronounced ain, spelled E N. In the Greek, the word is ain. And it's pronounced ain, and it's spelled, if you transliterate it, it'd be spelled the same way it is in the Spanish, en. And it means in. It means in. So let me read this to you, the way that it's actually written. To whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery in the Gentiles. Now, I told you that the primary meaning for the word Gentiles, it could mean nations to the Jews if you weren't a Jew, you were considered a Gentile. Synonymous word for that would be Greek. They called it the Jews and the Greeks. If you weren't a Jew, you were a Gentile. But the word, literally, the primary meaning for this word Gentiles literally means the family of man. So listen. To whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery in the family of man... Now listen to this, and here it is. He's given us what this is, what this mystery in the family of man, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So who are we talking about? Who, who is that for right there? It's for everybody. It's for the family of man. Do they know it? No. Do they need to believe it? Yes. Yes. Can they reject it? Yes, they can. You know, if you've got a disobedient child, we saw the story of the prodigal. He was disobedient. He looked like he was not the father's son. He was not living like the father's son. He was not acting like the father's son. He was living as if he were dead to the father. That's exactly how he lived. How did he see himself? He saw himself as dead and separated from the Father. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, the first thing they did was they hid from God. They separated themselves from God. What did God do? He sought them. He searched for them. That's exactly right. And he made a covering for their sin. It was the first picture of the shed blood of the Lamb of God. It says <clears throat> he took the skins of an, of an animal and made a covering. That was the first time we'd seen death in the garden. It was a picture of the cross. 
this riches of the glory of, of this mystery in the Gentiles or in the family of man, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now look at verse 28. So what do we do? We proclaim him. We tell people admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Every man, every man, every man complete in Christ. So what are we doing? We're telling people who they are in Christ. That's what it says. We proclaim this. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, the power of the Spirit, which mightily works within me. Have you ever seen this before? You've read it. You've read it, but have you ever seen this before? This is the Spirit revealing this to you. First, uh, First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Let's look at this. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Spirit who is, what are those next two words? In you. Where is the Spirit? In you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. So do you see a pattern here? Do you see a pattern? The Spirit is the one who convinces you of your righteousness. The Spirit is the one who reveals the mystery to the family of man, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Spirit is the one who lives in you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and let's look at, we sang this verse. Let's look at Romans 8, 1 through 3. Therefore, because of these things, listen, because of these things, there is, uh, therefore, there is now no condemnation. Now, if you see Romans 8, Romans 8 follows Romans 7, which follows Romans 6, which follows Romans 5. Romans 5, it tells us that we have been justified by his blood. What part of that was your part? No. Didn't have one? It also tells us that we were reconciled while we were an enemy. Now, he never looked at us as an enemy. We looked at him as an enemy. He looked at us as a child, his child. We were reconciled while we looked at God as an enemy. We were justified by his blood on the cross. Just. And then, and by, by the way, the word just and the word righteous and the word justification, all same root word. And then it says we were saved by his life. So, again, what part of any of that's your part? You don't have one. And then Romans 6, it says we've died to self. We've died. Romans 7 talks about the trouble that comes when we try to do our best. We want to run back to the law. And if you'll read the first four verses in Romans chapter 7, you're going to see that is spiritual adultery. Because you've died to the law. And then now Romans 8, summing up Romans 6, 7. 5, 6, 7, it says, therefore, summing all that up, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, my next question would be, based on the verses that I've already shown you, who's in Christ Jesus? All. All. You say, do you mean God doesn't even condemn Hitler? Was Hitler wicked? Absolutely. Did he do bad things? Terrible things. Do people do terrible things? Terrible things. Terrible things. But I can tell you right now, what he did and gave to you, he has done for and given to everyone alive, or it's been alive. Have all believed it? No. Have all received it? No. Will they? Boy, I'd sure like to be wrong on that. I don't, I don't see that everybody is going to believe Christ, but boy, wouldn't that be great? To those who are in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. So in other words, here you go. God is not condemning you. If you're listening to this and you've never trusted Christ, God is not condemning you. I want you to listen. He loves you. He has given himself not only for you, but to you, and he did it from eternity past. You were chosen in him from before the foundation of the world. You're loved. 
and you've been adopted as sons from before the foundation of the world. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit, the spirit revealing to you, my life is in Christ Jesus and his life is mine has set you free from the law of sin and death. You are not under the law of sin and death. That is not you. Will you believe this? Will you receive this life that he's already given you as your own? Will you receive the position that he's given you, his position? Will you receive this as your own? Boy, you'll be so glad. And it says in verse 3, and I want you to listen. You religious folks, you religious folks, I want you to listen to this. For what the law could not do. Why do we hang out with something that has no power? The law is the power of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He wasn't, but it was the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, not you. He who knew no sin became sin. The condemnation fell on him. God wasn't punishing you, I mean punishing Jesus so he didn't have to punish you. That wasn't what he was doing. God was doing away with the power of sin over your life. Sin had to die, and it did. Now we deal with flesh. And what we tend to do with flesh, I think good flesh, quote-unquote, causes more trouble than bad flesh. What are you talking about? Robbing and stealing, that's bad flesh. Yeah, it is. I don't like it. But let me tell you what. When you tell people they need to quit robbing and stealing, they need to do right, you're giving them an impossible command because you can't. Flesh can't overcome flesh flesh is you trying to do something to become who you think you want to be that's Craig Snyder folks you need to understand who you are you need to understand what he's done who he's given himself to you and you need to understand that the Spirit of God is the rocket fuel that empowers our life He's given us his mind to think with. We think different. Do you think different? When you run into a situation, sometimes we'll act just like everybody else, not who you are. You're walking according to the flesh. But when you calm down and say, Lord, just speak to me, tell me. And he'll reveal truth to you that I don't have to reveal to you. In fact, there are some of you right now that are arguing with me because you don't like this. Because it's not what you've always been told. But there are others of you that are ready to come to the end of yourself that are saying, praise God. Yes, I am so thrilled. I'm so grateful. Am I right? Isn't that what you're saying? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Well, you tell people this. When I finished praying for my buddy yesterday, and I was praying this way for him, and I looked up and he was crying. Not because he was afraid. No, no. Because that wasn't it. He was crying because he knew it was true. He was glad. Tell people that are hurting this. You watch what happens. It'll change lives. Religious folks aren't going to like it until God reveals to them the truth that he's revealed to you. So don't even discount religious folks because, you see, that was me, and that was probably you too. So we'll... Let it go now, and uh, I want to tell you how grateful I am for you. And uh, you can pray for me if you want to, too. I've got some issues, you know, this getting old, let's face it, this old body, it ain't what it was, you know. People say, I'm not getting better, I'm getting, I'm not getting older, I'm getting better. I'm getting older, <laughs> okay. The body doesn't work like it did. It does not, and I've got some, some issues you don't even have to know. Just Just pray for me, if you will. I appreciate it. And I'm going to receive it and believe it. So uh, I love you guys. And uh, I'll see you next time.